yesterday we're down here about eight or ten hours because the lightning caused all kinds of problems at back and I had to do all kinds of things all over but uh, but God we had tested the mics everything was fine um, once on um, Maui right now it's funny uh, he went to Whole Foods as soon as he got off the uh, airplane and he runs into my daughter and and then Judy over there, so it's, it's funny. But uh, on the back table, you'll see these little flyers. Uh, this is something coming in March. You'll see the dates on his three nights we're going to do. Um, it's going to be, Jay's going to be here. He's the one that him and I are going to Israel together. Uh, the first night will be a slideshow and teaching really on Israel, explaining a lot of things that people don't know. Um, Second to that, the biblical, that'll be on a Wednesday night. A Thursday night, we'll be doing a biblical feast here. It is not a Seder. Please understand that. A biblical feast is not a Seder. What we will be doing is what is typically done at the time of Christ on Shabbat. Culture will be explained. Uh, for those that can get down on the floor, how many can get down on the floor and get up? Okay. There will be tables down here that you can sit on the floor. Bring your pillow. I'll remind you before the time comes. And it, it'll be set up just like it was then. And um, we'll, we'll be eating with our fingers on a lot of things, just like they did. Um, we'll have lamb. We'll have chicken. Uh, if my wife is feeling good, uh, we'll have matzo ball soup because everybody seems to like chicken soup. It's the uh, penicillin for Jewish moms. But uh, anyways, uh, the following night on Friday night, we're doing a Galilean wedding feast. Most people don't understand the Galilean wedding feast. Um, Jesus spoke primarily, his teaching was primarily to Galileans. So there's phraseology that would have made sense to the people in Galilee and not to Judea, and that's what we'll be explaining that final night. Um, and it's actually a picture of the rapture. I'll give you just a quick thought. I've, I've said it before. But when Jesus said in John 14, I go and prepare a place for you, if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. That's exactly what a groom would say to his bride-to-be. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you and me, and he's coming back. And no one knows the hour of the time but the Father. Now, guys, when you wanted to go get your bride, you wanted to go get your bride and get married, right? But the Father says, no. <laughs> no. And you're building on the house. No. That's why Jesus doesn't know, because the Father in heaven will say that perfect moment to come back. Uh, it's a, a great thing to, to see. In addition to that, we have these in the back table. There's some, these are mylar blankets. They'll protect people from rain and keep them warm. If you know somebody needs them, put, put a few in your car. I'll, I'll get more. Uh, at times like this, people need it. And for the homeless, these are great. We hand them out with the homeless because they're small. And when they're carrying around a big blanket, it gets wet. Who wants to, who wants to wrap a wet blanket around you? So... Um, also, how to get to heaven from where? Hilo we're in. So we have these tracks back there. And they're great things if you pay your bills on, uh, you know, and mail it. it. It uses all the directions that you would see driving down the street. Uh, you turn. We need to change our mind and change our hearts. Yield. We need to change drivers. You can see all the little details. Um, it's a great springboard to share with that. But if you have your Bibles, please open with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 18 through 22. And we're going to be looking at the triumph of Christ's suffering. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to bring your word before your people. And I pray that you will put the words in my mind, my heart, in my mouth, the things that you would have me speak. And Lord, if there's anything that you don't want me to say, I ask that you just shut my mouth. Because Lord, we need fresh manna from you today. We need your word. 
We need open hearts, so we ask that you'd open our hearts, our minds, our ears, and that it would cause us to surrender our will to you. That we'd no longer be doing what's right in our own eyes, but really what's pleasing and honoring to you. Forgive us for those times that we fight against your will, that we try to take things in our own hands. Lord, we want to surrender again today to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been in Peter a while, First Peter that is, and the thing that I want to remind you of, Peter, is the theme is submission, and it's submission for you and me in this sense in suffering, affliction. If the Lord tarries much longer, you will see more and more. Many are suffering physically. Many are suffering emotionally. Mentally. We all suffer in some capacity. We need to be sympathetic. And we have a, we have a high priest that's sympathetic, compassionate, merciful, desiring to reveal himself each and every day if you just only open your heart up to him. Things may not make sense in your life, but you do know how the book ends. You do know where you're going. And everything that he allows in your life, in my life, he's going to use for his glory, amen? And as we go down that path, I find when I've kind of put my feet up and hands back and said, no, Lord, not this. And you get down the road a ways and you say, Lord, if only for this, it's all worth it. When we look in hindsight, the Father knows what he wants to accomplish in you and me. Let me read our text and then we'll break it apart and look at it. Again, that's First Peter 3. Verse 18, beginning, For Christ also died for the sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which we also went and made proclamation to the spirits, now in prison, who once was disobedient, and when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and who is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after the angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. These, I've said this before, but many passages are like this. Some of the most controversial verses in the Bible. And all I'm going to ask you to do as I explain the text as we go through it we break it apart, that you think about it, you pray about it, you focus on really what's important, essentials, and not divide over other opinions. And some, I'll show you, in one place, there's over 18 different interpretations by commentators, known commentators. And these are difficult verses. So what we need to do is lift out the main part of these verses while addressing them all at the same time. See, at the heart of the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, died for sinners. See, he died for you while you were in your worst. He knew your sins. He knew my sins. And even if you sin today, which you will, Nothing surprises him. 
a lot of people beat themselves up. How could God even accept me? I, I confessed, I repented, I did it again and again and again. I'm not going to ask you to hold your hands up. We all have struggles, would we agree? We all have weak moments. We have little things, triggers, and set things in motion. But I'm going to tell you, as you grow in the love and grace of Jesus Christ, you'll find that you're stronger and stronger and stronger in him. You'll truly learn what it means to cast your cares upon him. And you quit trying on your own power. Anyone guilty of trying on their own power? We just get in the way of what God wants to do. We go through things that we should never, ever have to go through. Well, look with me in verse 18. We begin with really the, the suffering that he demonstrated. And I'm going to add that word all. For Christ also died for the sins once for all. If you have a, just an open Bible and you have a pencil, highlight, circle all. There are those in the church that says he only died for the elect. The Bible is very clear. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever. There's not just elect group. And while you're chosen before the foundation of the world, people have tried to solve this problem for 2,000 years, and they can't solve it, and they're beating their heads together. But I'll make it simple how I see it. You're going to have to establish in your own means. Up there is an exit sign. I'm looking over this little area here, moving from the lower level to the higher it says, whosoever will. This is the door of salvation. That's through Jesus Christ. He claimed to be the door. When you get on the other side, when you go through that door, you look back and it says, chosen before the foundation of the world. Gosh, how do you reconcile? That's the only way I come up. God, you know. You knew me when I was in my mother's womb. You knew me. 6,000 years ago, how many, I, I, he knew. He knew you'd be here today. He knew your kids. God's all knowing, and you and I, well, <laughs> we don't know much, do we? We think we do. The more I know, the, <laughs> the more I, I realize I don't know as much as I thought I knew. In the previous verse, Peter had declared that it could be the will of God that you and I suffer for just doing the right thing. It's God's will. He, he says, I'm going to use that. It's my will. All who desire to live godly will be persecuted. We've talked about that. Now Peter gives the, the greatest example of suffering. The Lord Jesus Christ himself. You know, he doesn't ask us to do anything he's not willing to do himself. And he will be the one that enables you, empowers you, to do exactly what he's shown you, called us to do. And, and that's why we lock our eyes upon the author and the finisher of faith. As, as we're following him, we will find that we are empowered. His calling is his enabling you. So Peter gives us these greatest examples of Christ himself. And Jesus said again, you've heard it. If anyone want to come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me daily. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? It's hard when you and I do it on our own power. But when we surrender our lives to him, when we submit to him, and it's, it's a process. It's a little here, a little there. As we're continually growing in all these areas, that we find that we are victorious. And that we're victorious in him. Let me read from Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who is that? Oh, that's all of us. 
the whole world, the ungodly. We're everything, before we came to Christ, everything that God wasn't. And then in Romans 5.10, notice what it says. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's these verses, as you begin to marinate your mind, hide them in your hearts. And when you're going through those difficult times, you begin to recite. Maybe, maybe your memory isn't that good as far as um, all the words together, but you remember numbers. Some people remember numbers. Where to find things real well. Yeah, you know what I mean. And you go back, pray through it. You thank God for what he's done. And then there's John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that. Jesus is full of grace and truth. He has come to reveal the Father. When you've seen him, you've seen the Father. You've seen the heart of the Father. So what we're seeing is he demonstrated that love on the cross. I'd like to point out to you that in verse 18 again, the reach. Notice, for Christ also died for the sins of who? For all. Not those in Calvary Chapel only. Or the Baptist church. Or even people that he even died for those that don't even go to church. He died for all. Never before was there a sacrifice like this sacrifice. Their sacrifices had to go again and again and again. And, and when they sacrificed, that blood sacrifice, all it did was pass the sins until the next year, atoning for the next year. And they would have to be done over and over and over again. The Jewish people are without a sacrificial system now. What's the covering for their sins? For them, it's good works. Did I do enough good works? We know that we're not saved by good works. But little by little, he's drawing people to himself. Thousands upon thousands of sacrifices, think for a second, were made in the Old Testament. But they couldn't accomplish the greatest need, and that was salvation. And salvation was only provided through Jesus Christ himself. With the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, there was always, a, as I mentioned, always a need for another sacrifice, another sacrifice. You have that assurance when you confess your sins. He's faithful just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And you're as white as snow. If you truly have been born again, you have that assurance you're going to heaven. In 1 John, when we get there, you'll see it's important to understand one of the reasons that book was written that you might know you have eternal life and that eternal life is I'm going to add these words because that's what it's saying the Lord Jesus Christ how can you have peace if you don't know where you're going to go when you die and yet there are many if they're doing on works you don't know whether you'd be good enough my mom went to the Church of Christ. I went to the Church of Christ when I was young. I don't normally mention names, but I think this is pertinent. They had to keep doing good works. She never knew. It took me seven years to deprogram her, reprogram her. She never knew whether she'd be good enough to go to heaven. That is a scary thought. You can go to heaven by believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, and you become his workmanship. Do you realize the impact of the truth when Peter said that Jesus Christ died once for all for the Jewish people? 
His sacrifice eliminated, again, the need for the temple. We know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. No more sacrifices. There's no need. God had laid this trail for the Jewish people, but they kept suppressing. Not all Jewish people. I have a lot of of Jewish friends that are uh, Messianic. And some don't even call themselves Messianic. Our identity is, well, yeah, I'm the Messiah, but whose identity is Jesus Christ, Yeshua, whatever you want to call him, he's all the same. The second person of the Godhead. When he died, the price for sin was fully paid. And for all that the bloodshed, it was done. Paul drives this point, and I'm, I believe it's Paul, it could be somebody else, people argue, who wrote the book of Hebrews. Holmes very strongly in the book of Hebrews. Let me read some Hebrews. Hebrews 7, verse 26 and 27. Notice what it says. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy and innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like the high priest to offer sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered himself up. Wow. Jesus died once for all. And then again in Hebrews 9, verse 24 through 28, for Christ did not enter the holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with the blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, at the consummation of the ages, He has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Inasmuch as he appointed men to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear the second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait for him. Anyone here eagerly waiting for him? Maybe somebody? Oh, yes. Yes. You know, and because we know what he has done. That is so fulfilling, so rewarding. And and you and I might say, but God, I'm so unworthy, which is true. Your worthiness is he imputes his holiness to you. He is the one when he calls you, when you're born again, he's the one that makes you worthy. He's the one that is working in you now through his Holy Spirit. He's the one who will finish the work one day. Isn't that wonderful? Well, again, in Hebrews 10.10, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You'll find this in many places in the Bible. Notice again, all, 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 and yet there are many that teach you've got to keep working. The, the service that you do comes out of a heart of love. He's been so good to you. you. You want to give your life to him. You want others to know the king of kings that you know. You want them to know the peace that he has given. And, and we do this, this is very important, out of a heart of love. We already have favor. We're not doing it to get favor. It's because we have favor. God, you've been so good. I want to give myself to you. And this is what he's teaching. Now the word once comes again from a word called hapax. It speaks as perpetual, not requiring repetition. It's once for all. This was a new concept to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people kind of put up their hands. No, they don't, they don't want to hear that at first. And sometimes we're, we're like that too. We hear something and we put our hands up. No, I don't, I don't want to accept that. I don't want to believe that. My, my church didn't teach that. What, what does the Bible teach? Wednesday morning, we're here, 9 o'clock, and we're doing a study on Wednesday mornings. We're, we're looking at Acts 17. We're looking at the Bereans. 
The Bereans, again, were more noble because they looked to see if it's so. And they daily went through the scripture to see if it's so. They weren't argumentative. They weren't saying, my pastor didn't say this or this or this. They looked to see what he was saying lined up with the word of God. That's why we put the scriptures on the screen so you can see. Now, do you remember Jesus' final words from the cross? Well, let me show you in John 19, verse 30. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The work, the sacrifice was complete. Three hours of darkness upon that cross. Every one of your sins, my sins, every person that's ever been born was being imputed to him. You ever see when they do a kind of a show and sometimes they, they flash through, uh, you know, like somebody's remembering something in the past, flash, 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 and all these different pictures, and Jesus was seeing every one of us. But we we're in our worst. But nothing stopped him from enduring the cross. Because he loved you. He loved me. It's in John, the Gospel of John again, chapter 1, verse 29, the next day. And this is John the Baptist is referring to here. He saw, John saw, Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was a relative. John probably played with him when he was a kid. They would gathered together around feast days and everything, but he had no concept of who Jesus was until later when John's ministry started. Jesus approaches him. And when he baptized him, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The, the skies opened up. The Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Aren't we all looking for those words that good and faithful servant, please, that we please God. Even when you come short of pleasing God, God knows your heart. I'm sure you've done something in you blowing it, just like me. But the heart was pure. And God looks at that heart. You thought you were right, but you were wrong. God knows. It's in Romans chapter 6, verse 10, it says, for the death uh, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Jesus defeated sin for all sinners for all time. Satan was crushed, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And then when we go to Hebrews, Hebrews 1, verse 3, it says, and he, referring to again Jesus, is the radiance of the glory, the exact representation of his nature. It upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He sat down because the work was finished. When you choose to trust and rest in Jesus Christ for your salvation, not just again for again forgiving your sins, but salvation saving you from yourself, transforming you and changing you, that's when you have that peace. Well, again, I want to talk about representation. See, Christ died. He was representing us, the sinner, when he died. That's why all the sins would be imputed to him. He took your sin. He took my sin upon him. Because that's the only way that we could ever, ever go to heaven. When the Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross... It was the just for the unjust. Any unjust here? And we're justified by Jesus Christ. The blood of the Lamb by believing and trusting in Him. See, Jesus Christ died in our place. He didn't deserve to die. We deserve to die. But He died for you and me. He was the just and righteous God of heaven. 
God gave himself for you and me. When Abraham went up the hill in Genesis 22, he was to sacrifice his son. It wasn't God's plan, but God was that whole picture so you and I would know that Abraham was saved. And his son says to him, Father, here's the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And I forget which translation it's in exactly that's the clearest, but it was said like this, God will provide himself. Isn't that the most humbling thought that God would provide him himself for you and me? See, I wasn't going to teach this message today because I didn't think everybody would be here. There's still some that are not here. But it would go on the internet. This is a message that's important. I was thinking, well, they'll do the days of Noah. It's been raining 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm praying. The Lord says, no, no, just keep doing the message. Because I want it to get out. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, and he made him who knew no sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. You're declared righteous by God. God sees you just as you never sinned. Well, we all know each one of us are stinkers, aren't we? We still have our struggles. But that's when we go back and say, I, I, I'm sorry. What can I do to make it right? Well, again, Jesus Christ took the sinner's place. He died instead of us. He died to pay our sins. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we do not see him who made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because the suffering of the death crowned him with glory and honor so that by the grace of God he might taste death again for everyone. There's a word you... You know, you got to focus on all, everyone. And it's so sad for me when I think about those that are trying to be good enough to get to heaven and they're trusting in their works. And what we need to do is trust in Jesus. If you're trusting in your works and what you do, as I read the scripture, you're not going to heaven. It's trusting in that finished work of the cross, what Jesus has done for you. God is love, and he demonstrated that. Again, the Bible says that God is patient and long-suffering. Let me read 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but all come to repentance. God has made every provision for you every provision for you, for me, for every person, every drug addict, no matter what sin, a person just simply needs to receive what Jesus Christ has done upon the cross and believe in him, submit to him, and God will set him free from the bondage in this life. Sadly, many are in bondage. Some are in bondage to Satan, blinded by the God of this world. Some are in bondage to drugs. And the list goes on of things. God does not want anyone to go to hell. And I've heard that, that saying, why does God send people to hell? No, you'll choose life or you'll choose death. The choice is yours. The provision is made. These are words that we need to share with people. And people say, well, I don't believe about that. And they argue about passages that aren't even in the Bible. They heard somebody say, you've got to bring them back to this. First, you've got to know it and hide it in your heart. Again, the words bring us to mean to, to lead before, to bring us into the presence of, or bring to. It carries the idea of being led in the presence or being presented to the king. Now, I don't want to meet the president, but if you wanted to meet the president of the United States, then there's a whole presentation that would lead you there. You need someone to introduce you, someone who has access. 
Jesus has access and Jesus made that access available because when he died, the veil was tore from top to bottom and we can boldly go to that throne of grace to see him, to talk to him. Ephesians says this in Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have our access, notes in one spirit to the Father. Now people, I, I want to pray for you whenever somebody wants prayer. But this is telling you and me that any one of us can boldly go to the throne of grace. God hears our prayers. You know, my, my prayers aren't, um, he doesn't answer my prayers more because I'm more special than you know. <laughs> he sees them all the same. He sees those who call upon his name. Those who trust him in Jesus. And, and, and he is going to do whatever he feels is best for you and me. It's in Hebrews 4.16, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. Sometimes that seems like almost every day and every hour you need that mercy and grace, isn't it? But, but he's there. He's willing. You know what? My wife... Uh, I may get in trouble for this one, but she has headphones on. She's listening to these messages. She's editing them for the radio. And then I come in the room and I'm starting to talk to her. And she goes, ah! God never, everyone's talking to him. He can discern it somehow. And he never gets tired of hearing you. We don't have that capability that our father has. Now, I want to read from the King James in this same verse, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain, again, mercy and find grace in a time of need. And I like that. We should have the confidence that we can go to him and we boldly go to him. And I think both are true because we need not be ashamed when we go to him. I need you. There's no place else I can go. So I come to the throne of grace. Well, there's the resurrection. Jesus uh, was having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Juan was gone today. Ken was supposed to come from Kona, and his car went out, and he couldn't get over here. That's why we did the, the Ken music and, and that we normally don't do. And then God was speaking to my heart. And you know how that is. You, you just sense he's saying something. Sometimes we need to do things like this because then God is speaking to someone else's heart to be involved and step to the plate to fill in. And you're going to be seeing that in the days to come. It's not our decision. It's God's decision. Well, as we move on, his phys physical body died. He stopped breathing. His heart stopped beating. Many critics have attacked the resurrection of, of Christ by claiming that he never really died. He was kind of in a swoon. He fainted, and, uh, and the coolness of the, the tomb just raised him up. And certainly, he's the one that pushed that 1,700-pound stone away after all he went through. And he simply got back in the world and walked away. Sometimes people just don't want to believe what the Scripture says. You'll either harden your heart, or you accept it. There are things in the Bible. I, I imagine all of us would agree with this. I just don't like. I, 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 I think I know what it means. I pray I'm wrong about what it sometimes. But I accept it as in the Bible. And when I need to know, when I really need to know, God opens it up sometimes in six months, sometimes it's five years. So I'll look back in an old book. I was, oh gosh, I had that question then. But he has to build precept on precept on precept in order for me to comprehend, to understand. My son's a mathematician, algebraic geometry, it's like way over my head. And if I were to try and go from two plus two to four, 
And you remember maybe the multiplication table was hard, but if you would try to go algebraic geometry, no, you couldn't do it. It's the same thing in the Bible. That's why he has to build precept on precept, step upon step. And that's why our faith, we're continually growing the faith because now we realize an aspect about him that we didn't understand before. We didn't understand why he allowed this or he did that. But we walk by faith, not by sight. We know what he's done. And this is what this passage about, what he's done, what he's gone through. And why did he do that? Because he loves you with an everlasting love. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we struggle with the fact that we don't love ourselves. I'm not going to ask you to hold your hands up. Why would I? Why would anybody love me? Well, let's move on. John, the Gospel of John, 19, verse 31 and 30, through 33, it says that the Jews, because it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was that high day, asked Pilate, that the, their legs would be broken so that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs on the first man, and then on the other who was crucified with them. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. See, they knew he was dead. And there are many things, and even in secular history, that you can reflect back on knowing he died. Josephus, a historian, declares that he died upon the cross. And then he also declares that where there are many talking about his resurrection, and, but he never addresses it personally, and we need to address it personally in our own life. See, all the smoke screens that everybody boils down to, and they have this and this and this, it really boils down, did he go to the cross and die? Die for the sins of the world, and was he raised from the grave? Almost sounds like an Easter message, eh? Peter clearly states that Jesus was put to death in the flesh. His physical body died, but he was quickened in the spirit. The quicken, the word quicken, and sometimes it doesn't add those words to make alive. It, it just means make alive. Brought back to life. In Acts chapter 2, verse 24, and God raised him again, put it into the agony of the death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Now, who raised Jesus from the grave? Well, I'm not going to go into it today. The Holy Spirit did, the Father did, and Jesus himself. All three are listed in the scripture. The Godhead is, is one, but there are three persons. They all function together. Whatever one does, the other one does. In Revelation, chapter 1, verse 17 through 18, written 60, roughly 60 years after Jesus had, had died and was resurrected. It says this, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death in Hades. And this is important. The key to death in Hades. And Christians, now stop and think here. Christians are the only ones who can sing the song, I serve a risen Savior. No other faith has a risen Savior. These, these words are, are essential, what he's saying here. Now, faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing the Word of God. It's good to read aloud because you're activating two senses. And then if you write it, some people write on top of it. It increases it more as I get older. I think I need to do that. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says this, If Christ has not been risen or raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential for the Christian faith. There are many who go to church, claim to be Christians, following Christ, do not believe in a literal resurrection of Christ. This is what the Bible talks about. Every wind of doctrine, people are tossed. This church teaches this, and 
church teaches that. That's why we go back to the Bible. What does the Bible always check everything you hear by the word of God? If something just, you get a little red flag, you know, you hear something, go and look it up in the Bible. Make a note on your phone, whatever you do, and look and read it. And it's important to understand. Well, there was a sermon he delivered. Well, I've got to watch my time here. In verse 19, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Wow. This is the greatest debate of all. Did Jesus go to hell and preach to those in hell? This is the dividing point for many. People can get beat red, argumentative, fight about. We're going to look at what the scripture says. In 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and commit them to a pit of darkness reserved for judgment. So we know that there is a place, some believe it's on the river Euphrates, places unimportant, it's in the center of the earth, being held for that day of judgment. Now this is something you're going to have to work out on your own. Maybe, maybe you won't understand it today. But as you keep reading through it, God will speak to you. And then in the book, it just speaks about these fallen angels too. These angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for judgment on that great day. So we're putting these different verses together. So they left their first estate. That means a place, a rank, a position, these angels. We know that they're, all the angels were created in creature-like holiness. But we know after the fall, there's some. Satan swept a third of the angels away, and they followed Satan. And these angels that he's talking about, not going into depth on it, these angels were so wicked that he had to put them in bondage. Because if they were here, what they would do in this world. Now there's a time that they may be released, and we can talk about that another time. But they're kept to protect you and me. Kept for that day of judgment. So what exactly does Peter mean when it says, Christ, he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Notice they're in prison. They're in bondage. They're in prison. They're kept. We might say they're like in chains. Whether they're in chains or not, I don't know, but they're kept. God has them in this one place. After his resurrection and before the ascension of heaven, there's this, this time gap that people want to argue about. Jesus descended uh, in, into the heart of heaven and proclaimed victory to those. Now let me, let me say this. There are 18, at least 18 known different interpretations on here on what these verses mean. I don't think we'll fully know until we get to heaven and I think when we get to heaven, it probably won't matter. Aren't you just going to be happy to be there? But, but there's some ideas. That this, it's in the scripture, so we have to try and look at it. So what, what the scripture appears to be teaching is Christ went there to herald his triumphant victory. That the work was finished on the cross. The things that they've been trying to stop from the very beginning. So Jesus proclaimed his defeat over Satan. Jesus gathered again the, the Old Testament saints that were believers, that were held. And, and there's two compartments there. there. There are those slated for judgment and those waiting for the Messiah to come, to be set free. And, and this is kind of the, the picture that is kind of sharing and again, so these Old Testament saints, they need to ascend. And, and notice what it says in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives or led captive a host of captives and he gave them gifts to men. Who are these captives? This is why some people believe these are the ones that were held captive in the sense, they have no bodies. They're, they're taken to be with heaven, the Old Testament saints. He proclaimed to those in the other uh, compartment, again, hey, Satan's conquered. 
your judgment's coming and it's not far away. So he ascended. What does it mean that he again um, also descended into the lower parts of the earth? That's where we get the idea of hell. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fulfill all things. So this is how they come up with this, this determination. And then it goes on. Let me read from the Old Testament now. Psalm 60. 818, you have ascended on high, you have led captive your captives, you have received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, and the Lord God may dwell there. So again, this was prophesied, and again, it's a hard thing to put together. Please don't let it divide you with others. When people want to argue over something, you know what, that's something we're going to find out. You know, there are wonderful things to talk about what Christ has done, amen? Why dwell in things that we just probably can never know on this side of eternity? Now, Colossians 2.15 says this, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made public display of them, having triumphed over, over them through him. And all this is pointing back, most scholars, conservative scholars, pointing back to this whole situation. Now, Philippians 1.23 says this, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. It's, it's talking about going to be to heaven. That's the better place. See, for you and me, to be absent of the body means to be what? Christ. Present with the Lord. And see, that we'll be caught up to be with him. But that wasn't the way it was in the Old Testament. Because the Messiah hadn't come, they, they couldn't be set free. This is why it appears to be necessary that he now brings them. These are just Old Testament saints. And then we, as, as we die in this world, we're caught up to be with. And what am I talking? Spirits, not, not bodies at this point. Okay? Now, clearly the New Testament teaches again that we immediately to go to be with the Lord. Let me read a passage, a little long, a little bit. Uh, Luke 16, 22, 26, and I'm not going to comment a lot on this. Now, the poor man died and carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. This is what we're talking about. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and, and Lazarus in his bosom. Let me just stop here. Uh, many people call this a parable. This is not a parable. You know the reason it's not a parable? Because it gives literal names to people. Every other, every parable you read, it doesn't give names to people. This is giving us a literal picture about heaven, about the time before heaven. Now, again, I'm going to pick up in verse 24, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus so that I may dip the tip of my finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, likewise in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is this great chasm that is fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able to, and that none may cross over there to us. We get that idea, that picture. There's people standing beside the chasm and, and Christ is the bridge to take it to heaven. People pull it from there lots of times. The idea is there's these two compartments. We, we don't fully understand. There, there's some that are waiting. They, they've had faith and believed in, in God, what God said, and they're going to be with the Lord. How was Adam saved? When he believed God. How was Abraham saved? When he believed God, it was credit to him righteousness. And they're waiting. We just happen to be waiting here, but we know the moment we're out of here, we know where we're going to be. Amen? Amen? So it's not something to argue about in Galatians 3, 6. Even so, Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteous. See, when you believe and trust in Jesus, it's reckoned to you as righteousness. God sees you with this right standing before him. Let me give another verse before we move on. And that's uh, chapter 20 of the Gospel John and verse 17. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend, um, I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. See, there's this time, this is talking about this time between Jesus getting his glorified body and this is the time after the grave when he's raised. This is when he would have went down. And that's what the scripture alludes to. Well, we'll see how it pans out when we get there. Well, let's look at verse 20. In, in 20 uh, through 21, it, it describes the degrees of, of, of really salvation. And let me focus on the word patience. Um, let me read the text first. Who once was disobedient, and when patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water, corresponding to that is baptism that now saves, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but it appeared to God in a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the patience of God is, is patient and long-suffering. They're both interchangeable. Psalm 86, 15 says this, but you, O Lord, a God that is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abundant loving kindness and truth. You can find that thought right through the scripture. In fact, when um, Moses wanted to see the glory of God, he saw the backside. He was hidden in the rock. And he describes the character of God in some of these things. And God's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Later, again, it's important to understand um, and our text in Luke 23, 34, it says, But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots, dividing up their garments among them. See, God was patient and long-suffering. Could you be patient hanging on the cross and see him dividing up your clothes and everything? No, we would strike out. We would be in anger. And, and, and it, God is so patient. And that patience you receive every day because we deserve hell. Because even as believers, we rebel. Just in the sinful nature, just react. Something triggers something. You do something. You say something. Well, again, God is so long-suffering that he could rightly judge us, cast us into hell. But he waits. He's waiting today for your repentance and my repentance. Isn't that wonderful that he's waiting for us? Well, there's God's provision, and that's, again, during the construction of the ark. And Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 7 says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and their every intent of thought and heart was only on evil continually. I'm going to stop there just for a second. Are we at that point now? The wickedness of the earth is so bad, they're continually thinking on evil. This is what the, when the judgment's going to come, when the time starts again for Israel, this is, this is a key factor. God's always shown when he finally judges, when man has come to that point of no return as a, as a general population. And I don't think we're far away as you look at the news and everything else that's happening around. You can't watch TV, you can't read books, you can't read the newspaper. I read a thing that's on, on, on ministry and pastors just going crazy. Sexual crimes, it doesn't matter what denomination it is. Child molestation. And, and the church is supposed to be a safe place. We need to pray for one another. I'm not saying you're going to do these things. We need to pray for the church. We need to pray for God's glory. But God is now beginning to judge the church, deal with the church. He's revealing there are wheat and tares growing side by side. He's beginning to reveal the tares right before this judgment. Oh, again, there was a point of no reprieve. The, God had already determined he's going to judge the world, but eight were saved by grace. And this is the message, it, and uh, God brought them through. Now, let me read from John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, that he might, um, that the world might be saved through him. That's the heart of God. 
And he who believes in him is not judged, and he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. What does it mean to believe in the name? It's not just believing Jesus is Lord and Savior, that we should do. But when it talks about the name, oftentimes it's talking about the very character. God does not like sin. He hates sin. He is holy. He is righteous. He must judge sin. God is truth. And you just go through the line of everything that God is. So you believe in this one who is unique, who has went to the cross willingly for you and me. That's the goal. Now there's a picture that you find also in, in those verses again of 20 through uh, 21. And it's about baptismal regeneration. Now see, some of the churches believe that you're not saved unless you're baptized. False. It is an ordinance. It is a command. But if you're on your deathbed like the thief on the cross, Jesus said, you'll see me in paradise today. See, when I lived in Waianae, there was a church in Maili on the point there. And they would not baptize anybody in the ocean right across the way because they, they felt if somebody was crossing the highway, which happens a lot in Waianae, and they got killed, they would go to hell. It wasn't enough to believe in Jesus Christ. Baptism is this picture, but it's identification with his death and be raised in the newness of life. It is only a symbol. But there are those that teach that you say through this baptism, they twist this, also in John 3, to say what they want to say. But we're to take out of the text what it says. Again, notice Peter says, baptism is a figure. It's a picture, depending on your translation. In other words, it's not that baptism saves. It's just a shadow of things. Baptism gives us a picture of salvation, and it's identification with Christ, his work. The place of safety in the ark is, is not the water. The ark was a type of Christ. It's when, when you are born again, you're placed in Christ. Your identity is Christ. So people get carried away with a lot of things. So I'm, these are my final points. And just a story on ark because of the time here I've gone over. Forgive me. The ark provided by God was through grace. He gave them warning. God provided for it. They'd never seen all the water. It's hard to even imagine that, why would you build this ark? And everybody was laughing. Second, God was sending judgment, but in his mercy he provided a way of escape for those who would believe. The believe in what God had said, that's how we're all saved. This was an act of grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Again, the ark was three stories. That's an interesting thing, and I'm not going to go off on the whole thing. It was three stories, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It becomes a shadow and pictures. This is what you find in the Bible, shadows and pictures. There are no, there's nothing new under the sun today. It's all been there. We, we have to be careful reading too much into it. The ark had a window. The, again, in Genesis 6.16, a window shall make, uh, be made in the ark. It is cubit. Uh, shall be finished. It's a cubit in size all the way around. And again, Noah's, Noah's look was upward. He looked out the window and he was looking upward. And that's what we need to do is be looking upwards, not down at the judgment. Many people are looking downward at the judgment, looking at what's going to happen. We need to fix our eyes on, on the one above. There was one door and God closed that door to salvation. Jesus says, I am the door. And we enter through him. There was an invitation uh, given. And the Lord said to Noah, Come, and thou and all thy household come into the ark. It was an invitation made in this world. The door's about to be shut. People have to choose. You can't force them. You can't drag them in. They have to decide. Do they want life or death? They were secure in the ark. I like that one. You are kept by the power of God until salvation. We'll see that later on in our text. And then Peter takes, takes us back to Noah's day and uses the illustration as long-suffering and patience. 
200 years, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. The message went out for a long, long time, and they, they saw the warning signs, but no one would believe. In the final verse 22, who is at the right hand of God, having gone to heaven after the angels and authorities and powers have been subjected. What we see is his supremacy here. He is now at the right hand of the Father. Scripture is clear that he's coming back again soon and very soon. Are you ready? He's ready to bring you home. He'll bring you home safely. Now one last story I should give you. Remember when the disciples were in the boat and the storm, I haven't even talked about this last week, and storms just coming over the top of the boat, and Jesus said, we're going to the other side. And they were, they were intimidated by the waves of the big storm, and he's maybe snoring in the back of the boat. And they shake him and wake him up. They're going to die. They're going to drown. They had little faith. They forgot that he said they were going to the other side. They forgot that he was with them. And for every believer he's with you, he'll never leave you or forsake you. Father, thank you today for your word that is timeless. Lord, we just pray that your word would just dwell deeply in our hearts, that you cause us to meditate upon it. So, Lord, be honored today in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Supposed to be one.